section twenty three of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b talks about flowers by mary decker welcome a talk about several things spake full well in language quaint and olden one who dwelleth by the castled rhine when he called the flowers so blue and golden stars that in earth's firmament do shine wondrous truths and manifold as wondrous god hath written in those stars above but not less in these bright flowerets under us stands the revelation of his love what changes have been manifested how unceasingly and with what deafness nature has silently wrought in tapestry and embroidery sculpture and painting till beauty is all around us in the green carpet of earth brightened with flowers and leafage of every hue no wonder the birds sing praises to him who gave them life with its fullness of blessings sad to think that man high over all and under the greatest obligation too often is silent in thanksgiving for the gifts of a father's love no month to me has such charms as june when nature's robes are so fresh and clean and the balmy air is redolent with fragrance how delightful to be abroad with the early worm and early bird working in the garden while the songsters give free concerts and the hum of the honey-bird and buzz of the bee set forth a good example a cheerful industry the house-plants have become established in the open border and are so glad to get away from artificial heat and confined atmosphere into the broad sunlight of heaven and breathe in full draughts of pure air and sweet dew that they put on their best attire and most attractive ornaments before the roses bloom the bed of geraniums looks bright with flowers each ambitious to excel his or her neighbor either in beauty of color or form or duration of bloom thus leaving me in perplexity as to choice when pliny bloomed everybody admired who saw his beauty then romeo with quite another style looked charming but when naomi unfolded her large trusses of double pips of a rare peculiar shade nobody ever saw a geranium quite so lovely and then its duration of bloom full six weeks jenny dolphus however became a dangerous rival a deeper richer shade and not a pip would she allow to fade so long as naomi looked so pert some said i like naomi the best others said i think jenny is the prettiest but beauty close by hearing the praises lavished on her sisters and perchance trusting in her good name came forth one day in dress of white with deep pink ornamentation never had such unique beauty as this ever been seen in geranium before and isn't it lovely just splendid what a beauty were uttered with exclamation points till she blushed with becoming modesty the flush spread and deepened until her face was completely suffused with the delicate tint making her yet more attractive wellington donned his crimson suit and de gasque an orange yellow pauline luca prima donna though she be appeared in dress of pure white and richard dean in scarlet with a white star that was very becoming new life thought to draw special attention by odd freaks and came out in a party-coloured dress of the most singular combinations part of it was scarlet dotted with white part of it half scarlet half salmon part of it widely striped and part white with just a flush of pink i must call him the clown of the family i have only named a few of the rare geraniums that adorn one of the beds of my garden for beauty free flowering and duration of bloom they cannot be surpassed interspersed with them are ornamental leaved geraniums crystal palace gem an improvement on cloth of gold marshall mccain the best of all the bronzes cherub deep green white and orange flowers carmine glenair beauty dr livingstone a new sweet-scented fine cut-leaved geranium happy thought one of the most attractive 
with its dark green leaves and creamy white centre here and there are commingled and crianthus of divers hues and coleosus giving a fine effect to the whole this is now the most attractive bed of all but when the lilies are in bloom and the dear little tea roses the bed parallel with it will be the sweetest if not so brilliant this year i have a tropical bed of oblong form a castor bean rises majestically in the centre two beautiful cannas each side while a dracaena a splendid croton two fancy caladiums and a few other choice plants fill the space the whole bordered with coxcombs in a few weeks this bed will look gorgeous and those filled with annuals will have changed from their present inattractiveness to delightful bloom august is really the month of fullness of blossom and of restful enjoyment of beauty and fragrance the weary days of preparation of bedding out and of weeding are over and one may now give themselves up to the enjoyment of the fruit of their labor till the chill nights of autumn bring a renewal of the toil does the brief period of restful enjoyment repay for the many weary days antecedent and subsequent yes richly fully for there is pleasure with the toil and to me health-giving influences that energize the physical system for indoor work and stimulate the brain for literary pursuits to me my garden is a godsend fraught with blessings gardening is a pleasant principle i am prepared to adopt that sentiment to-day if i did demure somewhat last month it is a delightful pastime in the early morning to spend an hour among the flowers trowel in hand rooting out the weeds loosening the soil around your plants and tying up here and there the tall and fragile while the birds are singing in the trees around you their morning song of gladness how the dew-laden grass and shrubs impart sweetness to the air and your lungs inhaling its purity are expanded and invigorated your whole system feels the better for the tonic and prepares for breakfast and the work that shall follow it is a pleasant pastime when wearied with toil you go forth for a time among your flowers and search for the buds or examine the newly opened flower how it rests you it is a pleasant pastime when the labors of the day are over and the sun is throwing long shadows from the west you take watering pot in hand and shower the refreshing spray upon your plants cleansing them from the dust and cooling them after the heat how they thrive and bud and bloom end of section twenty three section twenty four of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org talks about flowers by mary decker welcome the love of flowers we should love flowers for when we are gone from this forgetful world a few short years nay months perhaps those whom we hold most dear cease to bedew our memories with tears and no more footsteps mark the paths that lead to where we dreamless lie but god's dear flowers give to our very graves the loveliness that won our tender praise when life was ours last words of the poet heine of the many touching tributes paid to flowers there is a beautiful one associated with the closing hours of henry heine the poet he was dying in paris the doctor was paying his usual visit when heine pressed his hand and said doctor you are my friend i ask a last favor tell me the truth the end is approaching is it not the doctor was silent thank you said heine calmly have you any request to make asked the doctor moved to tears yes replied the poet my wife sleeps do not disturb her take from the table the fragrant flowers she brought me this morning i love flowers so dearly thanks place them upon my breast he paused as he inhaled their perfume his eyes closed and he murmured flowers flowers how beautiful is nature these were his last words the old man and the flowers a few years since the belfast m e journal gave this touching incident one day last week an elderly man known to our people as an honest and hard-working citizen was walking slowly up main street 
there was sorrow in his countenance and the shadow of grief upon his face opposite the savings bank his eye caught the sight of the flowering oleander that with other plants filled the bay window of the banking-room he looked at it long and wistfully at length he pushed open the door and approaching mr q said will you give me a few of those flowers the cashier leaving the counting of money and the computing of interest came around the counter bent down the plant cut off a cluster of blossoms and placed it in the man's toil-hardened hand his curiosity led him to ask what do you want them for my little granddaughter died of scarlet fever last night the man replied with faltering voice and i want to put them in her coffin blessed be flowers that can thus solace the bereavement of death and lend their brightness as a bloom to the last resting-place of the loved one converted by a flower there is a beautiful incident told of a texas gentleman who was an unbeliever in the christian religion one day he was walking in the woods reading the writings of plato he came to where the great writer uses the phrase god geometrizes he thought to himself if i could only see plan and order in god's works i could be a believer just then he saw a little texas star at his feet he picked it up and then thoughtlessly began to count its petals he found there were five he counted the stamens and there were five of them he counted the divisions at the base of the flower there were five of them he then set about multiplying these three fives to see how many chances there were of a flower being brought into existence without the aid of mind and having in it these three fives the chances against it were one hundred and twenty-five to one he thought that was very strange he examined another flower and found it the same he multiplied one hundred and twenty-five by itself to see how many chances there were against there being two flowers each having these exact relations of numbers he found the chances against it were thirteen thousand six hundred and twenty-five to one but all around him were multitudes of these little flowers and they had been growing and blooming there for years he thought this showed the order of intelligence and that the mind that ordained it was god and so he shut up his book picked up the little flower kissed it and exclaimed bloom on little flowers sing on little birds you have a god and i have a god the god that made these little flowers made me end of section twenty four section twenty five of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b talks about flowers by mary decker welcome a talk about abutilons this species is one of the most desirable of hardy wooded plants we possess they are admirable for the house for the balcony the piazza or the border being handsome in foliage and very graceful and beautiful in flowers some are stately others dwarf some are flexible and drooping we have had for several years three that we have greatly admired for their variegated leaves especially for the winter window garden where they compensate for the scarcity of flowers by the brilliancy of their foliage yellow and green finely mottled and marbled duke de malakoff is stately and by cutting off the top of the main stalk it is made to branch out very largely forming a miniature tree it grows very rapidly and its leaves are like the maple in form which has led many to call the plant flowering maple but this is not correct as it is not a maple at all but an abutilon some of the leaves on one only a year old measure seven inches across and eight and a half in length in the older plant they are not so large thompsoni much resembles malakoff but its markings are not so handsome the green is darker and predominates over the yellow so far as my observation extends but it is a more abundant bloomer flowers are orange color i have vainly searched through many catalogues to find the color of the duke de malakoff blossom but all are silent it is not even said that they flower at all but my four-year-old one had one bud last year which unfortunately blighted the yearling has one bud and i hope it will live and afford me the knowledge i have failed to find in books malakoff not variegated has large orange bells 
striped with brown my other variegated abutilons are of trailing habit mesopotamicum is very graceful one droops over the side and climbs and twines around the cords of a large hanging pot for which it is admirably adapted its small pendant blossoms crimson and yellow growing profusely along the slender branches drooping among the elegantly marbled foliage give this variety a very attractive charm another is trained to a pot trellis and is very beautiful in this form we advise every one to add this variety to their collection pictum is very similar in every respect the leaves are darker and not so variegated they require a strong light to bring out their markings and hence are more perfect in beauty when bedded out in the garden where they can have plenty of sunshine boule de neige fairy bell has long been a favorite for its pure white bells and constancy of bloom a splendid winter bloomer john hopkins with its rich dark glossy leaves and golden flowers has superseded the old pearl door which was for a time the only real yellow darwinii is one of my favorites the flowers are more spreading than any other variety opening like a parasol color orange scarlet veined with pink it blossoms very profusely and when only a few inches in height the flowers are large and well formed and borne in clusters rather than singly like many older sorts this variety was cross fertilized with santana crimson flower and as a result we have darwinii tessellatum combining the variegated foliage of thomsoni with the free blooming qualities of darwinii the improvements by hybridizing have been very great within a few years and many new varieties have been sent out one of these is roseum superbum the flowers of which are of a rich rose color veined with a delicate pink very free bloomer venison we find only in an english catalogue the magnificent blooms of this variety place it at the top of all the abutilons although it is of tall growth its beautiful palm-shaped leaves and gorgeous flowers make it invaluable for crossing and for conservatories h cannell among the new and valuable novelties of american origin are arthur belsham robert george j h skinner and joseph hill these have been three years before the public and mr john thorpe a well-known popular florist of queens new york says of them we have not amongst all the flowering abutilons such fine varieties as these i have had plants between five and six feet high pyramidal shape and literally covered with flowers they originated with messrs leeds and company of richmond indiana who make quite a specialty of new seedling abutilons and this year offer four of new shades and colors a g porter flowers of a beautiful lavender color delicately suffused with a light shade of rosy pink and handsomely veined with magenta forming a flower of magnificent color and shape a very free bloomer a cross between boule de neige and rosa flora with the habit and growth of boule de neige little beauty a very dwarf grower having a short compact symmetrical bush which is completely covered with its medium-sized but well-shaped flowers of a very light salmon color beautifully veined with rosy carmine it blooms in clusters and when in full bloom makes a remarkably fine appearance a cross between rosa flora and darwinii n b stover a low compact grower flowers large and well formed almost covering the bush color rich ponceau finely veined with carmine a decided novelty being a new color among abutilons dr rapples light orange salmon veined with crimson one of the most attractive in the set a new abutilon a decided novelty in color comes to us from the home for flowers swanley england sent with other choice plants by henry cannell and son it is thus described in his floral guide firefly swanley red by far the highest and brightest color of all the family habit dwarf and one of the freest bloomers throwing flowers out on strong foot stalks of the finest shape certainly one of the noblest and when grown in a pot it flowers all the winter and all the summer when planted out and forms one of the best flowering shrubs that we possess parentage of this flower mr george states that he sometimes since flowered a small red variety 
which had a very lively shade of color and determining to make this a seed parent it occurred to him to use on it the pollen of the single deep color hibiscus which like the abutilon is included in the natural order malfaceae mr george thinks the fine color seen in his new variety firefly is due to this happy inspiration of color the gardener's chronicle has this paragraph respecting firefly a red abutilon one of a batch of recent seedlings raised by mr j george of putney heath well deserves the foregoing appellation the flowers are of large size and of a much greater depth and vividness of color than that possessed by any variety in the chiswick collection it has been provisionally named firefly and we believe the stock has passed into the hands of h cannell and son of swanley for distribution a writer in vick's magazine describes a method of training the abutilon that must we think be a very attractive one a pretty plant may be obtained by inarching abutilon mesopotamicum upon abutilon darwinii or some other strong growing variety and training it so as to form an umbrella head which can easily be done the stock for this purpose should be about five or six feet high grown in this way it produces an abundance of bloom and the flowers being elevated are seen in all their beauty if abutilon mesopotamicum is inarched upon abutilon thompsoni the result will be abutilon mesopotamicum variegatum a well-formed plant of this on a stock about five feet high is one of the finest of plants whether in blossom or not it is always adapted for decorative or exhibition purposes care must be taken at all times to keep them tied to stakes as they are liable to be broken off by the wind abutilines are apt to be infested by the red spider if kept in too dry an atmosphere and not frequently sprayed moisture is death to this pest but as it makes its home on the under side of the leaf it is too often overlooked until it has destroyed the vitality of the foliage recently i found that my large duke to malakoff looked sickly and i concluded it had become root-bound a few days later i noticed brown spots thickly covering the bark i removed one and on examining the under side through a microscope i saw several tiny insects moving about i decided that my plant was troubled with the scale of which i had often read but never seen i made a strong solution of soap suds and with a sponge quite easily removed all of the pests in bedding out abutilons it is better to have them in pots plugging the hole or setting the pot on a stone or piece of brick so that the roots may not go astray for if plunged directly in the ground they throw out many roots and the plant becomes too large for repotting to advantage if however they are planted in the earth in august they should be cut around the stock so as to bring the roots within due bounds and the plant can be pruned in the autumn this method is applicable to all strong plants that run largely to roots they should be cut off sufficiently to leave only a ball of earth of convenient size to set in the pot when the plant is transplanted end of section twenty six section twenty six of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b talks about flowers by mary decker welcome a talk about dahlias the genus dahlia comprises but few species all natives of the mountains of mexico whose range is from five thousand to ten thousand feet above the level of the sea about one hundred years ago a spanish botanist introduced seeds of the dahlia into his native country and named the genus in honor of a swedish botanist dahl the first seed imported seemed to be variable and not very promising about seventy years since humboldt sent fresh seed to germany soon after this both seeds and bulbs were introduced into england and france and began to attract considerable attention some enthusiasts being rash enough to hazard the assertion that there are considerable reasons for thinking that the dahlia will hereafter be raised with double flowers about eighteen twelve 
probably the first double dahlia was grown but for several years after this both double and single varieties were figured in colored plates and exhibited at horticultural shows that the single varieties were prized is not strange for the double were not very good and even as late as eighteen eighteen published figures showed very imperfect flowers the improvement of the dahlia after this was rapid and its popularity quite kept pace with its improvement dahlia exhibitions were held in england and on the continent which were crowded by enthusiastic admirers of this wonderful mexican flower for many years the dahlia maintained its popularity but there is a fashion in flowers as in almost everything and for a time the dahlia became to a certain extent unfashionable and this was well for it placed the flower upon merit alone and growers were compelled to introduce new and superior varieties to command either attention or sale for their favorite flower a taste for old styles is now the correct thing and so we have imitations of ancient earthenware furniture etc and import original chinese aster seed and also obtain roots of the single dahlia from mexico there are three pretty distinct classes the show dahlias the dwarf or bedding and the pom-pom or bouquet and to this we may add the fancy dahlia the show dahlia grows from three to four feet in height and embraces all our finest sorts fit for exhibition at horticultural shows from which the name is derived the flowers range in size from two and a half to five inches in diameter the striped and mottled and spotted varieties belonging to the show section are called fancy and though not as rich nor usually as highly prized as the selfs or those of one color are very attractive the dwarf or bedding dahlia grows about eighteen inches in height and makes a thick compact bush and covers a good deal of surface flowers of the size of show dahlias they are therefore very desirable for bedding and massing the pompon or bouquet dahlia makes a pretty compact plant about three feet in height the leaves are small and the flowers from one to two inches in diameter many expect to find small flowers on their dwarf dahlias and feel disappointed because they are of the ordinary size not knowing that it is the plant and not the flower that is dwarfed and that only the pompon gives the small flowers the word pompon is french for top-knot or trinket meaning about the same as the english word cockade the english term bouquet is very appropriate as the flowers are so small they are very suitable for bouquets being of a spreading habit they cover a good deal of ground unlike most of our bedding out plants they do best in a poor soil if rich they grow to branches and leaves so much they bloom sparingly and late generally those who plant dahlias purchase the tuberous roots because they give good strong plants that flower freely without trouble or risk they are smaller and better than the large coarse roots usually grown because they are raised from cuttings and generally form their roots in pots when a tuber is planted a number of buds that cluster around its top will push and form shoots and if too numerous a portion should be removed indeed one good strong plant will suffice and then the plant will become a tree instead of a bush even then if the top becomes too thick a little thinning of the branches will be of advantage if the young shoots that start from the neck of the bulb are cut off near a joint and placed in a hotbed in sandy soil they will root form good plants and flower quite as well as plants grown from the tuber this however requires some care and experience and amateurs generally will succeed best with bulbs new varieties of dahlias of course are from seed some of them prove good others fair and a portion utterly worthless as a general rule we would not advise amateurs to trouble with seeds although there is pleasure in watching the birth and development of a new and beautiful variety the seed of dahlias may be sown in pots in early spring or end of winter in a light loamy soil they will germinate quickly and as soon as they begin to show their second leaves they should be pricked out into other pots or boxes so that they may have plenty of room and air 
they are very liable to damp off if at all crowded after pricking out they should be kept in a thrifty growing condition by proper attention to watering and temperature the temperature should be maintained as near seventy degrees as possible and the watering be sufficient to preserve a moderate moisture if the green fly attack them it will be best to treat them to a very weak dilution of tobacco water the young succulent plants are very sensitive to smoke and it is best not to fumigate them in about two months the young plants should be large enough to pot off singly or to be transplanted into a frame or bed where protection can be given them from the cold of night time or from late frosts as soon as all danger is past they can be transplanted into their summer quarters and should stand at least three feet apart the soil where they are to grow should be rich and mellow in august they will come into flower and those having blooms worthy of cultivation can be retained and the others destroyed only a small proportion of the plants grown from common seed produce flowers equal to those now in cultivation but when seed is saved from a choice collection of name varieties the chances are that a large proportion of the plants will produce very good flowers vix magazine the dahlia is called a gross feeder but it is not it loves moisture rather than rich elemental food in clay it finds the best constituents of its development moisture silex lime and alumnia so we say to those who love this queenly flower if you would see the queen in all her glory plant in a comparatively heavy soil no manure and reduce the stalks to one for each tuber set the stakes firmly to keep the stalks from swaying and if the season is dry give the bulbs a soaking with water every evening during the drought my word for it you will then be proud of your success the pompon or bouquet dahlia is a favorite variety of this genus the little round balls of bloom are so pretty and trim beatrice blush tinted with violet dr stein deep maroon striped and mottled gold finder golden yellow little philip creamy buff edged with lilac little valentine crimson mine strifling salmon striped with crimson pearl white prima donna white fimbriated perfection deep maroon single dahlias anything for a change from the common order of things seems to be the fashion nowadays in flowers as well as in house building and house furnishing the antique the antique is the rage so after years of labor and hybridization to bring the dahlia up from its native state of single blessedness to its enormous cauliflower blooms there comes a reaction and now single dahlias are praised as the most beautiful of all flowers the par excellence the londoner's flower well let the english florists thus praise its beauty if they want to but we opine that on this side of the great ocean it will never be considered the most beautiful of all flowers however attractive some of them may be and well adapted for bouquets there is no danger of their superseding the doubles but it is well to have both when one can afford it their present high price puts them beyond the reach of those whose purses are not well filled but in a year or two when the novelty is worn off they can be purchased at half or even less perhaps than their present price we find in the london garden the following dahlia perfecta originally introduced by messrs henderson is perhaps the finest flower which we possess unless paragon brought into notice by h Cannell, may be considered to bear away the palm lutea a quilled yellow is also a grand bouquet flower the single dahlias paragon and lutea are now offered for the first time in this country by messrs hallock and thorpe of queens new york and the former is finely illustrated in their catalogue color very dark velvety maroon with shadings of bright scarlet around each petal small yellow disc lutea is pure yellow with dark orange centre the same firm offered dahlia juarazi of which mr canal says the grandest novelty of the year and not only a novelty but a most valuable and useful decorative plant for all purposes through the late summer and autumn months 
its blossoms are of a rich crimson and very much resemble in shape and color the well-known cactus cereus speciosissimus height about three feet very bushy flowers of very striking appearance and quite unlike those of an ordinary double dahlia the flowerets being flat and not cupped figured in gardner's chronicle october fourth eighteen seventy nine and awarded a botanical certificate royal horticultural society the following statement was made in the gardener's chronicle respecting this new type a remarkable box of dahlias was shown by messrs cannell with three or four of the single forms which if it were not heresy to say so we should so much prefer to the formal lumps so dear to the florist proper and then there was a new type of dahlia altogether a sea anemone among dahlias with long crimson scarlet pointed petals like the tentacles of an antinia a striking novelty christened temporarily the cactus dahlia and which will be the parent of a new strain it received a botanical certificate some said this ought to have a higher award but what higher or more appropriate form of a certificate could be given to such a flower if we were a dahlia we should greatly prefer the honor of a botanical to that of a first-class certificate this new type is illustrated in halleck and thorpe's catalogue two new dahlias not yet introduced in this country are included among the novelties of eighteen eighty one cannell's scarlet a show dahlia several shades higher and brighter in color than any scarlet before introduced its shape is most model-like and not excelled by any other and is without doubt the best dahlia of the year miss cannell eckford mr eckford's dahlia memorial was the king of best shapes for many years but the one now offered is of greater excellence and by far the best of its class color white tipped with rose pink and the depth and build of flower is most model like end of section twenty six section twenty seven of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by devora allen talks about flowers by mary decker welcome amaryllis these are the finest of all summer flowering bulbs throwing up strong flower stems in june and july bearing from two to six magnificent lily-like blossoms the varieties are numerous but only a few sorts are found catalogued amaryllis johnsonii is the finest of the commonly grown varieties its leaves are a dark rich green two inches broad and two feet long the flowers, which are five or six inches long, are crimson with a white stripe through the center of each petal, and are borne upon a stalk two feet high. They usually bloom twice a year, the flowers appearing just as the leaves begin to grow. Amaryllis formosissima is of a very peculiar form. The flowers are scarlet crimson, very velvety in appearance. There are six petals, three of them nearly erect, and three drooping very long. After being bedded out, it quickly throws up a flower stalk and blooms before the leaves appear. It is a superb flower, known sometimes by the name of Jacobean lily. Amaryllis vitata is a splendid hybrid, red ground striped with white. Amaryllis velota purpurea is an evergreen variety and should be kept growing the year round. In August, it throws up a flower stem from one foot to 18 inches high, bearing a cluster of light scarlet flowers two or three inches in diameter. A light soil and small pot suits it best. Mr. John Lewis Child of Queens, New York, has a finer collection and more numerous varieties than are usually found named in the catalogues. Some of them we will specify. Johnsonii grandiflora, an improvement on the well-known Johnsonii harrisoni, large, pure white, with double crimson streaks running through each petal. It has a delicious orange blossom fragrance. Reticulata, a bright rose color, the foliage is very attractive. Dark green with a white stripe running through the center of each leaf. Aulica stenopelalon, a magnificent species, having large orange-crimson flowers, beautifully veined with scarlet. Equestre flpl, 
This grand novelty was discovered in 1877, in one of the West India Islands. The flowers are perfectly double, resembling those of a large camellia. Its color is rich, fiery orange-red. We believe we have the only stock of this beautiful flower in America. John L. Child This and Harrisoni are priced at $4.50, so they must be very rare and beautiful. Aspasie, white, tinted with yellow and red, large and perfect. Crinum amenum, new and very beautiful, white striped crimson. Lutea, a hardy variety, which blooms in the autumn, pure yellow. Californica, pure white. The bulbs are of easy culture. After blooming, and the foliage fully grown, they should be allowed to rest for several months, then start into growth by watering sparingly until the flower stalks appear, when a more liberal supply should be given. Usually two successions of bloom can thus be obtained. The bulb should be planted so as to leave the upper portion uncovered. End of section 27《セクション28of Talks About Flowers》This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Tammy Merritt《Talks About Flowers》by Mary Decker Welcome《Hoya carnosa or wax plant This plant is a native to tropical Asia where it is partially parasitical its roots penetrating the bark of the trees which support it. It was introduced into England in 1802. There are several species, but only one is generally cultivated. Hoya carnosa has thick, waxy leaves and bears umbrals of beautiful flesh-colored flowers, which are very wax-like in appearance. It is an excellent plant for house culture as it stands the extremes of heat and cold better than most plants and is not easily injured by neglect it can be trained to climb on trellis work to almost any height and when in bloom which continues for half a year it is a very interesting plant there are several varieties of hoya but one only is generally cultivated silver variegated foliage is said to be very handsome but is of slow growth and difficult to propagate imperialis is a new variety with beautiful foliage and scarlet flowers. Cunningham has light green leaves, deeper colored flowers than a carnassa, and is a rapid grower. They succeed best in peat with some fibrous soil and sand. They must have perfect drainage and require a period of rest. Hoya coronosa is easily propagated from cuttings. A very good method is to wrap the cutting in moss, keeping it moist until the roots are well started. End of section 28. Section 29 of Talks About Flowers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Talks about flowers by Mary Decker Welcome Among My Flowers August is the month when we rest from our labor in gardening and abandon ourselves to the full enjoyment of the varied blossoms which so abundantly meet our eye. Now we can best determine what changes may be required in the arrangement of our plants next year in order to give the most pleasing effect a tall plant may have been inadvertently set out in the midst of those of low growth and we see now how awkward it looks short-lived annuals may have occupied a conspicuous place and on their departure left an unseemly vacancy a bed may have been filled with a class of plants that are not free bloomers and so there has been little beside leaves while another bed has been brilliant during all the summer months with flowers annuals of a new kind high price novelties have been tested are they any better than our old favorites if we cannot indulge in many sorts what do we find the most satisfactory 
twenty-five cents per packet seemed very expensive for hedigy pinks but crimson bell and eastern queen are of such superior size and rare beauty that the investment is not regretted and then we know that they will bloom in greater perfection next year and that the seed saved this autumn and sown in early spring will increase the stock twenty-five cents for a paper of candy tough seed looks extravagant but no one who invests in tom thumb would regret it it is so dwarf so compact and bushy such a long continued bloomer so admirable for edging a bed that it is really almost an essential then it will sow itself and the seedlings will be up as soon as the frost is out of the ground and plants from self-sown seed are so much more thrifty and early than those one sows in the spring that this is a great gain candy tough white pink light purple dark purple and crimson i find it well worth while to culture for early and profuse flowers and admirably adapted for bouquets i always have large quantities of the white to set off the brighter flowers and by sowing seed in june and july have a succession of blooming plants foxglove both white and purple with their thimble shaped spotted blossoms profusely borne on tall spikes with side branches loaded with bloom has been one of the greatly admired flowers of my garden plumbago with its clusters of tube flowers of the palest of blue is very beautiful godetia lady albemarle i have found to be all that it is represented for two months it has been in constant bloom and it will continue to flower till frost it is of a bushy compact habit about twelve inches high the flowers are from three to four inches in diameter and of a rosy carmine color everybody who has seen it has a word of praise for this most beautiful of all the godetias elba is a new variety having pure white flowers in cygnus is pure white with a crimson blotch on each petal whitney's is of dwarf habit and has large flowers blush colored marked about the center with a handsome crimson stain the new french marigolds cloth of gold and meteor are just splendid with their large and beautifully striped imbricated leaves one has gold bars evenly marked on the rich dark velvety petals and the other has deep orange stripes on a pale straw-colored almost white ground meteor is a perfect gem among the calendulas convolvulus minor new crimson violet with yellow eye encircled with a band of pure white dark blue and light blue with yellow eye margined with white pure white with yellow eye and blue and white striped are very pretty free-blooming dwarfs of this species my stalks are very fine from mixed seed of the german new large flowering they are mostly very double the creamy white are especially beautiful the bright crimson and canary yellow are handsome there are many varieties of this species but what are generally termed ten weeks stock are best known they are classed under five heads dwarf miniature large flowered pyramidal and wall flower leaved then there are the intermediate stocks prized for their late autumn blooming of which there are twelve or more varieties the german brompton stocks are divided into two sections brompton and hybrid or corcordian the latter bloom with a single stem which forms a splendid pyramid of flowers and is cultivated largely in pots seeds sown in early spring will bloom in autumn and if carefully potted will flower during winter if sown in july and august and cultivated in pots will flower the following spring and summer the imperial or emperor stalks sometimes called perpetual are large flowering and white rose crimson and blood red in color hardy's all the year round is a perpetual bloomer the plants grow about twelve inches high and produce hundreds of bunches of double white flowers let us linger a little while at this rose bed are not those teas lovely look at madame lambard one of the finest french roses imported recently from paris is not the color exquisite a beautiful shade of silver bronze changing to salmon and fawn delicately shaded with carmine rose and so deliciously fragrant that rose so large and full with a rare shade of violet red 
brightened with crimson maroon is a line sisley it is surprising how such a tiny plant could have produced such an immense flower and this is letty coles a new french rose very handsome and sweet color rosy pink deeply jaded with intense crimson pearl des jardins is magnificent with its rich golden yellow and bon saline has long been a special favorite its buds are large and beautiful that charming white so deliciously scented is mademoiselle rachel and this one with pure deep green flowers is verdiflora or green rose scentless and of no value except as a curiosity this grand rose is abel carriere a hybrid perpetual more beautiful i think than the popular jacques minot in the perfectness of its form and richness of its color the outer petals are bright glowing crimson scarlet while the centre is a deep fiery red but it will never do to linger longer among the sweet roses for there are many other flowers to show you i think that hydrangea with its immense trusses of bloom is just one of the most desirable shrubs we can have in the garden i have had mine six or seven years and it bore three clusters of flowers the first year though a wee plant it blooms from august till hard frost and needs no protection in the winter though i do sometimes put a mulching of straw or a bit of brush around the roots a lady writing to vix magazine says of this hydrangea the first year i planted hydrangea grandiflora it produced three heads of flowers the second fifty six and the third year ninety two thorough cultivation and a pail of liquid manure once a week help the plant to bear this enormous load of flowers hydrangea alaska is a more recent acquisition its flowers frequently measure twelve inches across and are of a bright pink color not hardy at the north hydrangea thomas hogg would be a very unpoetical name did it not remind one of the ettrick shepherd this variety was sent to the united states from japan by that eminent botanist for whom it is named and has become deservedly popular it belongs to the hortensia section of the family but is a far more abundant bloomer than any other the flowers are of the purest white a very firm texture and retain their beauty for a long time a more recent novelty sent from japan by mr hogg is the new climbing hydrangea which he describes as clinging to trees to the height of fifty feet producing corums of white flowers of the size of ordinary hydrangeas it clings exactly like the ivy and must produce a striking effect when in full bloom it is entirely hardy mr peter henderson was the first to offer this novelty here and in europe elegantissima is a novelty truly with its leaves flaked bordered and striped with golden yellow i do not know whether it blossoms or not it is handsome enough without flowers heliotrope the new heliotrope la negre is the darkest of this genus and snow wreath the nearest approach to white we have yet had truss very large growth compact and fragrance exquisite garibaldi is almost white mrs burgess is dark violet and duc de lavendury is a rich blue dark eye sweet asylum is another of the essential flowers for the border admirable for edgings for its dwarf habit and continuity of bloom the great novelty of last year was the new double variegated sweet asylum the gem the flowers are very full and the foliage broad with a mid rib of light green bordered on each side with pure white it is a fine compact grower and far superior to anything of this species yet offered lantanas i think add greatly to the attractions of the garden so rich in color and profuse in blooming cotilda pink with yellow centre and cotesse de diencourt flower bright rose and yellow centre sulphur are very desirable elba perfecta pure white is fine so also is elba lutea grandiflora white with yellow centre mine d'or is a new variety with bright orange and crimson flowers and golden variegated foliage m schmidt is a beautiful novelty flowers of a brilliant yellow passing into purple vermilion grows in the style of a petunia end of among my flowers
section thirty of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen talks about flowers by mary decker welcome a talk about cyclamens and oxalis next to primroses and by no means below them in value we place the cyclamen the leaves a deep green with white embroidery are very ornamental but when surmounted with a wealth of bloom what can be more charming two of mine have begun to blossom a white and a pink and the buds are numerous others will bloom later they continue in bloom for a long period and are easy of culture though where there is over dryness of atmosphere they are apt to be infested with the red spider they need to be frequently sprayed and it is well to immerse occasionally the entire plant in water so as to wet the under surface of the leaves the water ought to be tepid and indeed for all plants in cold weather to keep the dirt from falling out when the plant is plunged top downward something can be wrapped around the pot a mixture of turfy loam and sandy peat is best but when not available leaf mould or a rich mellow soil mixed with silver sand will do there are several varieties of cyclamen but the most common is persicum and many catalogues name no other one of mine is gigantium an improvement on persicum the flowers being much larger and finer in every respect among many catalogues i find this name in only one persicum white and pink is a sweet scented variety from cyprus africanum white and rose from africa heterofolium from britain other rare and expensive sorts are mackenzie white crimson and rose-colored europium red and coom which in the early spring months bears above its very ornamental leaves a profusion of small bright rosy crimson and snow-white turbinate blossoms of a roundish recurved outline blotched with violet crimson at the base very beautiful the bulbs of all cyclamens except coom should be placed on the surface of the soil covered half an inch and water given moderately till the leaves are fully developed and the flowers appear when it may be applied more liberally do not make a mistake and plant your bulb upside down as did a lady i know of i have an idea that it is put in wrong but as the leaves seem to come from the under side she writes it is difficult to tell sometimes which is the right side to put down persicum with its dabbled green and silvery gray rounded heart-shaped leaves embroidered margarines is a fine ornament but when these are surmounted with a profusion of pure silvery white oblong lanceolate petals blotched with violet crimson at their base borne on slender flower scopes the plant is very beautiful it varies in color from snow-white delicate peach and rosy crimson some are delightfully fragrant during the growing and flowering season the plant should have a full exposure to light but not to the intense sunshine after blooming the bulbs may be allowed a time of rest removing them to a cool and shady place in the border if desired watering rarely in early autumn repot and after a few weeks of growth water more freely it does not however injure the plant to keep it constantly growing and the best florists have very generally abandoned their former method of letting them rest during the summer cyclamen autumnal flor alba white and rubra red blossom in the autumn oxalis the winter blooming varieties are admirably adapted for hanging pots and being cheap and very easy of cultivation they ought to be in every dwelling there are one hundred and fifty known varieties though our catalogues rarely name half a dozen some are strictly winter bloomers others flower only in summer and some blossom the year round the floribunda varieties belong to this class of perpetuals ortgisi also which is a wonderful bloomer and on account of its erect growth is admirably adapted for pot culture it is a new and somewhat rare species from brazil it often grows eighteen inches high and in good form the upper side of the leaf is rich olive green and the under side bright violet purple the flowers are quite small yellow and borne in clusters the special beauty is in the foliage 
floribunda alba and rosea have tuberous roots the foliage is very strong and the clusters of bloom are borne on long footstalks starting directly from the tuber a single small tuber will often have a hundred open flowers at a time they are from one half to three quarters of an inch in diameter this variety can be obtained and planted at any time of the year it is admirably adapted for baskets or a hanging pot oxalis acetosella is the true shamrock of ireland flowers are white borne on stalks two to four inches high versi color is a winter bloomer color white with bright pink margins to the petals requires sunshine the flowers will not expand in cloudy weather floribunda has no such freaks but smiles in the storm as well as the sunshine a lady writing to mr vick becomes enthusiastic over her oxalis she says the sixth of last october i planted a bulb of oxalis versi color and it is just beginning to bloom and oh what lovely flowers delicate and perfect in form pure white with just the faintest tinge of yellow in the centre and beautiful crimson stripes on the outside the plant also is of a very graceful habit bearing its tuft of small leaves and clusters of flowers on the top of a short slender stem it seems strange that so small a bulb can produce such beautiful flowers of bowi she thus writes a year ago last october i planted a bulb of oxalis bowi in a small bed the bulb was so very small that i did not believe the flowers could amount to much but was soon most agreeably disappointed such a mass of flowers on one small plant i had never seen before and such large bright-coloured flowers many stopped to admire it and ask its name it continued to produce a mass of flowers the entire winter and part of the spring until the sun became very hot from this one bulb i obtained eight which i wrapped in paper and kept in a dry place about the first of august they commenced growing and so i planted them and the first of september they were in full bloom though the flower grew large as the days became less hot until they were nearly as large as petunias the soil in which they grew was mostly sand and rich surface earth from the woods and i sometimes watered them with weak soap suds mr vick to whom we are indebted for the most of our information on the subject says that this variety has large thick fleshy leaves and large bright rose-coloured flowers the largest indeed of any of the cultivated kinds in his illustrated article he gives an engraving of one named cernus plena the flowers of which resemble double portulacas erect born in clusters we regret that he gives no reference to this variety whatever it must be a rare sort probably not in the market here end of a talk about cyclamens and oxalis section thirty one of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen talks about flowers by mary decker welcome a talk about lilies consider the lilies thus spake one wiser than solomon even he whose hand created and beautified the lilies with a glory surpassing that of the greatest of israel's kings this department of the floral kingdom is too vast for us to explore we can only make a selection of a few of the numerous varieties for consideration gathering our information from the various sources at hand and adapting it to our present use the lily is the rival of the rose and by many is considered far superior they certainly are far more easily cultivated they are hardy elegant gorgeous sometimes and sometimes of snowy purity many of them are of exquisite fragrance there are early and late bloomers and one can have these desirable flowers in succession for several months by a right selection the earliest bloomers are the pomponiums natives of siberia and are perfectly hardy the lancifolium or speciosum is the autumn blooming lily native of japan lancifolium album a fine sort with pure white petals and a pea-green stripe very fragrant lancifolium rubrum and roseum though catalogued separately 
are the same with different shadings some purplish crimson others a faint blush of rose some have a red stripe others a dark dull green but all are specially recommended lancifolium punctatum burum is a late bloomer color clear white with soft rose spots and green stripes finest of the species lancifolium praecox flowers white with a purplish blush at the tips lancifolium monstrosum arcorum biflorum rubrum bears its crimson flowers in large clusters grows to a great size the lancifolium lilies are of special value for their hardiness and varied beauty and their cheapness places them within general reach they are classed under the head of martagons or turks cap oratum imperial is the golden banded lily of japan which has become so extensively known and popular since its introduction from japan by mr gordon dexter it was first exhibited in july eighteen sixty two at the massachusetts horticultural exhibition it first bloomed in england the same year it was for some time considered too tender for the canadas and new england states but it proved to be hardy we have had ours twelve years and give it only a slight protection the petals of the oratum are snowy white with a golden band running down the center of each and freely spotted on the sides with deep carmine red they are very fragrant being of somewhat slender growth they need support it does best in a warm sandy soil that has been well manured and dug deeply it is easily propagated from the scales of the bulbs each scale producing a small bulbette they should be planted in a box about a foot deep in good friable soil about three inches deep and one inch apart sink the box in some out-of-the-way place in the garden and water frequently in a short time small bulbs will be found forming on the base which rapidly grow and must be transplanted out the second year in the bed the third or fourth year it will bloom the little bulbettes which form on the mother bulb blossom a year earlier they should be renewed in the fall after the foliage is dead plant in a bed about four inches deep and let them remain undisturbed for two years then they are large enough to bloom and should be transplanted into a permanent bed if required longiforum lilies these trumpet-shaped lilies are charming in appearance quite hardy and fragrant they bloom in july or august and continue in beauty for a long time longiflorum japonicum blooms in july and is a fine dwarf better color pure white with occasionally a greenish tinge outside increases rapidly eximium bears a longer flower from six to nine inches in length and is more open at the mouth than the common longiflorum pure white and very fragrant brownie is a native of japan and is a grand lily of rare beauty it resembles longiflorum in shape but is larger and more expanding color white inside exterior brownish purple stamens rich chocolate which forms a distinctive feature in this species it has been frequently confounded with japonicum but the difference is very marked in the illustrations of the two and are thus noted in messrs hollock and thorpe's catalogue of lilies japonicum odorum japonicum cholesteri one of the most beautiful and rarest lilies in cultivation it differs from brownie and all the forms of longiflorum in many respects note the following marked differences its broader fewer and more spreading leaves the shape of the entire flower and broader claw of its divisions its shorter anthers with pollen tinged with red the flower is solitary and large interior pure white exterior of a pinkish brown color tubular bell-shaped with spreading revolute tips the bud shows a rich golden tint bulb white or whitish yellow never red or brown broad at the base the scales which are somewhat narrow and acute at the tip the outer ones terminate at about two-thirds of the height of the inner scales whereas brown e the scales are broad and all passed up overlapping and terminate together at the apex of the bulb thus making the base much narrower than the apex it is a native of japan and is so exceedingly rare that it is priced at seven dollars more than double the cost of any other in the list brown e was priced when a novelty at four dollars 
but is now offered for one dollar and seventy five cents candidum sometimes called easter lily is one of the best known and commonly grown of all the lilies it has been in cultivation for about three hundred years bears a profusion of pure white fragrant flowers in a compact head the double tiger lily is a very great improvement on the old single variety it is very double and very showy wallace is a new japanese variety said to be magnificent color buff spotted with black chelsea donicum or scarlet martagon is supposed to be the lily of the field mentioned in the gospel it is magnificent and its intense scarlet is one of the finest shades in the whole vegetable kingdom a full bed is a most magnificent sight and if suddenly looked at on a bright day has nearly the same effect for a moment as if looking at the sun it is much scarcer than it should be and requires careful culture to be planted about six or eight inches deep and watered in the summer time it pleases every one who is capable of being pleased lilies as well as many other bloomers are greatly improved by thinning out the overplus thus concentrating the sap to fewer blossoms which being thus liberally nourished greatly increase in size and amply repay by their superiority for the loss in numbers although this is a demonstrated fact yet few have the courage to prune where flowers are not very abundant and many will not when they are those who have limited space are loath to devote much room to lilies preferring plants that bloom continually throughout the season or that make more show but it is not essential that the bed should be devoted exclusively to lilies for early spring blooming there can be the crocuses snowdrops hyacinths tulips all of which will bloom before the lilies and after flowering can be taken up i e the tulips and hyacinths and low bedding plants take their places portulaca pansy ageratum mignonette nemophilia sweet asylum are all suitable for this purpose and will not only make the bed beautiful all the season with their blossoms but will also be of real benefit to the lilies by shading their roots somewhat and keeping the soil more cool and moist lilies must never be crowded a foot or twenty inches is about right the soil should be dug deep and mixed with old rotted manure and sand liberally unless the soil is naturally sandy if heavy clayey soil it ought to have in addition to sharp sand leaf mould and bog muck plant the bulbs from six to eight inches deep according to the size last autumn in planting my lily tulip hyacinth and other bulbs i made a little bed for each of pure sand and then covered well with soil over which was put a blanket of old dressing then before snow a cover of boughs the bulbs never came up so grandly nor grew so rapidly before october is the best month for bedding out later will do and many do not plant their lilies till the frost is out in the spring the two leading lily growers of this country are john l child and v h hollock and thorpe of queens new york End of A Talk About Lilies Section 32 of Talks About Flowers This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Talks About Flowers by Mary Decker Welcome double white bouvardia alfred nooner this is indeed a novelty among this class of valuable plants being the first double ever known it is said to be equal if not superior in profuse blooming quality and vigorous healthy growth to the single white variety davidson sonii of which it is a sport the flowers are rather larger than those of the single flowering and composed of three perfect rows of petals of the purest waxy white color each floweret resembling a miniature tuberose the trusses are large and perfect and are freely and without interruption produced even on the small side shoots which generally make no flowers on the single one it is highly praised by mr thomas meehan florist and editor of the gardener's monthly and by mr henry a drear florist of philadelphia 
a grand thing says mr meehan gives great satisfaction it has excelled our expectation says mr drear my own specimen about four inches in height has twelve buds two small clusters are on side shoots the very fine illustration of this bouvardia we give our readers has been kindly loaned by the ellis brothers keen new hampshire who have a fine stock with which they are offering to the public mr henry Cannell says of all plants the bouvardia in our opinion excels for cut flowers no matter either for buttonhole bouquets or table decoration a spray of it is sure to be most prominent and pleasing and the odor of several kinds is deliciously refreshing and if well grown they will more or less continue flowering nine months out of the year strange to say they need only the ordinary course of cultivation of the winter flowering zonal pelargonium hitherto they have been treated as a stove plant whereas they only need a temperature not higher than fifty to sixty degrees and in the summer to have every attention like a specimen chrysanthemum and on the first appearance of frost to be taken into the house and when growing and flowering to be supplied with liquid manure occasionally our only experience with this genus has been with bouvardia humboldtii corymbiflora and it has proved to be a very valuable plant its pure white flowers are produced in large trusses their tubes are three inches in length and very fragrant it blooms very freely and for a long period this variety and vrelandi are the best single white liantha is a dazzling scarlet and a very profuse bloomer elegans salmon scarlet large and fine lady hyslop a light rose canspicua is of a blood-red color with whitish tube bicolor a summer flowering variety flower tube purple with tint of blue and delicately mottled flesh tipped with white these last we find only in Cannell's floral guide i have no difficulty in keeping my bouvardia in the cellar the leaves drop off but they come out anew in the spring end of section thirty two section thirty three of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by betty b talks about flowers by mary decker welcome camellia japonica this is a very popular genus on account of their rich dark green leaves and beautiful rose-like flowers they are hardy greenhouse plants and thrive best in light loam mixed with sand and peat but will do well in light soil without the peat it will not flourish in a limestone soil mr vick gives the following in his magazine the camellia japonica was sent to england in seventeen thirty nine by father camel a missionary for whom it was named as a house plant the camellia requires considerable care on account of the tendency of the flower buds to drop off a northern exposure is best and a temperature of from forty to fifty degrees when the buds are swelling water plentifully with warm water but allow none to stand in the saucer sponge the leaves once a week in the spring put the plant out in a shady place on the north side of a house or fence not under the drip of trees and water it every day set the pots on a hard bottom so that no worms can get into them they form their flower beds during the summer and at this time a good growth of wood must be encouraged in the southern states the camellia can be raised with not more than ordinary care at the north it must be considered entirely a greenhouse plant and as such will always be highly prized we are often asked how it should be cared for as a house plant and to all such in the northern part of the country where it is necessary to maintain good fires in warm houses for several months of the year we have no hesitation in saying let it alone do not expend care and labor where there is so little prospect of reward camellias are of many hues and some are beautifully striped general lafayette bright rose striped with white imbricated 
bell roman imbricated large flower and petals rose striated with bright crimson mateo mofino petals cerise with pure white band down centre mrs lerman crimson spotted very beautiful pure colors of white red crimson rose and carmine can be obtained end of section thirty three section thirty four of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by kathleen talks about flowers by mary decker welcome azalea shrubby greenhouse plants of easy cultivation very showy and hardy like the camellia they are found in all the leading colors and also striped blotched and spotted they are both single and double alexander too is white striped with vermilion edges of petals fringed aurelia white striped with rosy orange amaranth spots flag of truce is a pure double white very fine her majesty is rosy lilac edged with white alice rose blotched with vermilion double mr vick gives the following directions azaleas need a light soil of sandy loam to which should be added one half leaf mould repotting should be done in may trimming the tops to bring them into shape then plunge in some sheltered spot in the garden in september the plants should be brought in under cover or into a cool room they do best when the temperature ranges from forty degrees at night to sixty five or seventy by day the foliage should be showered once a week but care must be taken that the roots are not over watered as they rot easily small plants bloom well but their beauty increases as they get age and size the flowers appear on the terminal shoots and are from one inch to two and a half inches in diameter azaleas if left to themselves will develop long shoots that after a time become naked below and are furnished with leaves only at their extremities flower stems are formed on the new wood of each summer's growth consequently the amount of bloom other things being equal depends upon the amount of new wood annually produced in order to have plants of good shape when they become large it is necessary to give attention to pinching and training them from the first the pyramid form or more properly that of a cone and rounded at the top is considered the best for the plant as it allows the greatest exposure of leaf surface two principal methods are adopted to regulate the growth and bring plants into shape one is by successive pinchings as the growth proceeds the other by allowing long shoots to grow and then bending and training them down thus causing many of the dormant buds along their whole length to break and develop into shoots a skilful combination of the two methods is probably better than either exclusively mr john dick philadelphia has the largest stock of camellias and azaleas it is stated in the united states their catalogue list of these plants embraces more than a hundred varieties to which we refer our readers end of section thirty four section thirty five of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by boat harbor houston texas talks about flowers by mary decker welcome the ingathering of the flowers we have come to see your garden said a gentleman with a lady in company they were from a neighboring town this two weeks after the heavy frost i told them my garden was in the stable and thither i piloted them it was not a very small garden if it was in a stable a hundred or more plants had been hurriedly removed from the beds the day before that freezing night there they were in the soiled pots just as taken from the ground or packed closely in boxes not very attractive looking in one sense yet in another they were for they were bright healthy appearing plants leaves as fresh as when in the open air 
pretty geraniums in bloom, a mass of lobelia, attractive with their tiny blue flowers, coleus of varied hues, and even a few roses struggling into bloom. Then we strolled among the despoiled beds, and the pansies, so large and pert, elicited admiration, and the sweet peas, just as fragrant as though blight were not all around them, while dear little mignonette seemed to have taken a new lease of life. Yesterday I arranged in a shallow glass dish as handsome a bouquet as I have had for the season. Sweet clover sprays, mignonette and fragrant geranium leaves for the foundation all around the dish, a few bunches of little white wax balls with their glossy leaves, geranium blossoms, and lots of sweet peas, from the most delicate shades to the deepest, and bunches of splendid pansies, sweet alisum, a bit of purple verbena here and there, and white-eyed phlox. It was just lovely. When the evidence was sure that frost was surely coming, and a great many plants must be taken up in a few hours' time, I was so glad that full half of them were in pots. I could never have potted a third of them in the time. The great object was to get them sheltered, and the repotting could be done at my leisure. But I almost changed my mind the other day after toiling several hours at the business. So many pots to wash, and then fill them with fresh earth, and set the plant. Oh dear, wasn't I tired! But then the wide door was open, the day was lovely, and I rather think potting plants in a stable is better than potting out of doors on a cold day, and when one is in a great hurry. Plants that are in pots plunged in the ground do not grow so many roots, and that is another advantage. End of section 35section 36 of talks about flowers this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by boat harbor houston texas talks about flowers by mary decker welcome my window box Perhaps I may as well tell you about my most important window box. I had it made last autumn, and I was greatly pleased with it. It is made of zinc, size one yard long, fourteen inches broad, seven inches in depth. To give it strength, it is framed at the top with wood. You can have this of black walnut or stained in imitation. You can have the box painted any color you wish, or leave it unpainted. In the center is Croton Wasmani, on the one side of it a fine Aranthemum Pictum. Its green leaves look as though they were painted with white streaks. On the other side, Acalypha Macafiana. These are the largest plants in my box, and they do not exceed ten inches in height. There are sixty plants in all, most averaging six inches in height, but a few are quite small. They consist of very choice geraniums, some of them handsome-leaved, variegated abutilons, lemon verbena, two bright acaranthes, six very beautiful coleuses, and four fine begonias. There are others I cannot stop to specify. You will see that I have filled my box with what are, in themselves, beautiful without the aid of flowers though i expect to have a few of these by and by i am perfectly satisfied with it however just as it is i had a large german ivy growing out of doors which consisted of several long vines this i planted in one corner of the box and then drooped and twined it on the outside the changed indoor life caused the large green leaves to fall off but already new ones have put forth and the vines are rapidly growing everything else has been previously prepared so that there was no change in their leafage after being put in the box it is a great addition to the beauty of the box to have vines of pretty foliage drape the sides this autumn i have had it placed on a small low table with casters so i can change the plants every week and thus avoid that turning toward the window which they always assume if kept in one position 
I first put in drainage and then filled the box with rich mellow earth in which was a mixture of one-third sand. I have been thus particular in my description for many no doubt who like myself have to make the most of limited space will be glad to know just how to keep the greatest number of plants to the best advantage not only is there a saving of room but of labor and it is more cleanly end of section thirty six Section 37 of Talks About Flowers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Talks About Flowers by Mary Decker. Welcome. Hyacinths. Among the essentials for winter flowers are the bulbs. Of these, the hyacinth takes the lead. They are so easily grown so lovely and so fragrant that they are worthy of a place in every collection they should be planted so that the upper surface of the bulb is visible water liberally and then put away in a cool dark place for several weeks six weeks is none too long and some i allow to remain a longer time bringing them to the light at intervals so as to have a succession of flowers they are very effective planted in a group they are very pretty in hyacinth classes but this method ruins the bulbs for future use planted out they will sometimes flower the best time to plant them in the border is in october but the first of november will do it is a good plan to make a little bed of sand for the bulb and then cover with light porous soil hyacinths are classed as tall and dwarf single and double the roman hyacinth is the earliest bloomer coming into flower about the holidays if started in season the spikes are small and flowers rather scattering as soon as the blooms fade the stalk should be removed and when the leaves turn yellow they can be cut off and the bulb dried and packed in paper bags and kept till time for autumn planting hyacinth bulbs come from holland about harlem the rubbish heaps are hyacinths and the air is oppressive with their perfume in california there grows what is called the twining hyacinth it grows in the mountains and twines about the bushes sometimes going up eight and ten feet after it gets to the top of the bush and rests a while it lets go of the earth and goes on blooming for months regardless of the burning sun the flower stem breaks off near the ground and the flowers are kept swinging in the air supported only by the bush about which it twines the color is deep rose and it is said to be very pretty the picture of it certainly looks attractive it is a large cluster composed of dozens of blossoms for flowering in the house the polyanthus narcissus are very desirable they can be put into glasses as well as the hyacinth but the most natural method is in a pot of earth and the bulb is in a better condition for after use the jonquils are also pretty snowdrops scillas and the crocus are cheap bulbs and planted in the autumn will show their bright sweet faces soon after the snow is gone they are also very fine for house culture should be planted in groups tulips ought to have a place in every garden they make a brilliant show in the spring when the beds are bare of other flowers and afford bloom for a long time if a good assortment is selected the pretty little dwarf duck van tholes are early bloomers and very gay they are admirable also for the house and by planting in september will come into flower in december there are early single and double tulips and also late bloomers so that by having a variety the border may look gay for a long time the parrot tulips are large and very brilliant in color and picturesque in appearance all of these varieties succeed in ordinary garden soil they ought to be planted in october or november about four to six inches apart and about four inches under the surface before severe frost they need to be protected by branches of evergreen straw or leaves after blooming and the leaves have died down they can be taken up dried and stored till autumn if the bed is needed for other flowers the bulb catalogues issued by leading florists in the autumn and 
sent free to all applicants will enable you to select just what you want end of section thirty seven Section 38 of Talks About Flowers. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Betty B. Talks About Flowers by Mary Decker Welcome. Insects. In a work of this character, it seems needful to treat more fully of those pests which proved so destructive to plant life that we have in our brief references the aphis or green louse is the one that most frequently infests our plants and the rapidity with which it multiplies is astonishing romer has proved that in five generations one aphis may be the progenitor of six thousand millions and there may be ten generations in a year the method most generally adopted for their destruction is fumigation with tobacco as this is attended with considerable difficulty a weak solution may be used quite as effectively we have had no experience with either method having used another with good success for several years this is white hellebore which we usually apply in the powder when the rose bushes are wet with dew or rain bending the branches over so that the application can be made chiefly on the under side of the leaves where the pests are found two or three times proves sufficient for our house plants we usually make a solution by putting half an ounce of the hellebore into pretty warm water and letting it stand for several hours stirring it up however before spraying the leaves afterward the plants need to be washed for the scale a strong solution of soap suds applied with a sponge or a small stiff brush a toothbrush is very suitable for this purpose for mealybug a mixture of one part alcohol and three parts water applying with a feather or what is better a camel hair brush another method is to use kerosene in the same way a florist who has practiced this for eight years says it is sure death to the insect the feather should be brushed all over the mealy-looking substances found usually in the axles of the leaves. Worms in Pots Lime water is a safe and effectual remedy for the little white worms often found in the soil. Slake the lime in water, and after it has settled, pour off the clear water and drench the earth. Ants Various remedies have proved effective one is to take a vial or a cup nearly filled with sweet oil and sink it in the ground where the ants resort so that the rim is on a level with the surface the ants are very fond of it but it is sure death to them a german writer says that carbolic acid and water will drive ants away from any grounds one hundred parts of water to one of the acid mix in a tub and stir repeatedly for twenty-four hours taking off the scum that rises to the top kerosene or coal oil mixed with water has proved very successful in the destruction of noxious insects and grubs a tablespoonful of the oil to two gallons of water is the rule for tender plants for hardy ones it will be necessary probably to have it of greater strength as the compound does not mix readily it needs to be thoroughly stirred and then quickly applied the best way is to draw it back and forth a few times in a syringe and then apply water tainted with coal oil poured into little holes made in mole tracks will it is said drive them effectually away end of section thirty eight end of talks about flowers by mary decker welcome